Welcome to another episode of Business Beyond Borders. Today, I'm really excited to have with us David In, who is currently a partner at GSR Ventures. Welcome, David, to today's episode. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And um, maybe we'll start off with you giving a quick introduction of what you're up to now. Um, what does your role at GSR Ventures look like? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so first of all, my name is David. I'm a Singaporean, but I've uh, worked, lived uh, in many different countries. Uh, so right now, I'm spending a lot of time between the U.S. and Southeast Asia. I'm a partner at GSR Ventures, uh, which is a early stage venture capital firm with around $4 billion assets under management. Uh, so I invest in company, companies across both regions, but also selectively in companies in other parts of the world, such as the UK and Brazil as well. Um, so uh, as, a, as an early stage fund, we've invested across most verticals. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I've also looked at many different verticals, uh, such as EV motorbikes in uh, Vietnam, HSS software in the Philippines, uh, and so on. Uh, but primarily, uh, given my previous experiences, I focus very much on the fintech and Web3. Nice, nice. And and with the focus on, um, you know, global kind of Web3 and fintech sector, how do you personally see the transformational potential of the journey in, this, in these industries? And specifically, maybe quite recently, what opportunities have really excited you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, I just see so much potential. <laughs> and one proxy I look into is I look into the underlying industry. So if you look at financial services as a sector, this yeah. is one of the largest, fastest growing, and yet still highly profitable businesses. Look at mm -hmm. the banks, look at um, the biggest uh, stocks, you know, yeah. in Singapore, in around the region, in many countries around the world, it's always the banks, right? And the reason yeah. is because they're making a lot of profits and it's a lot of revenue pool and profit pool. And I think with the power of technology, mm -hmm. you, can, um, you can basically both work with existing incumbents, but also sometimes help to create new uh, new businesses. And this is across so many different areas. I could go into them, but I'll say that two primary areas I'm looking to are in the payments and credit space. Okay. So in the payment space, for example, this could include domestic payments. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Stripe, uh, they processed uh, just between Black Friday and Cyber Monday. They processed <laughs> close to $20 billion in wow. payment volumes. Uh, and in terms of revenue, just within these few days, made almost half a billion in revenues. That that shows the extent of uh, the amount of payments that happens. Yeah. Uh, and we ourselves actually invested in a Singapore-based fintech called Niem mm. that has gone beyond Singapore globally. And nice. it's doing extremely well as well. So I think within payments, there's so much that can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on the lending space, there's a lot that can be done as well. Um, I can highlight, you know, we, we invest in another Singapore-based company called mm -hmm. uh, Atome that oh. uh, started locally but has gone to different markets. Mm -hmm. uh, also invest in a company in the UK called Fintern. So it's also in the lending space. But what's interesting about them is that they're applying AI to mm -hmm. open banking data. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, they're able to really underwrite customers who are hugely underserved and not able to get a proper loan right now and they're able to serve these segments yeah. so i think whether it's payments lending and obviously you have other sectors like insurance investments mm -hmm. and so on i think there's a lot that technology can do to improve financial services yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. And also because you are looking at, you know, the fintech industry across different um, regions, right? Maybe it would be helpful for you to um, share a little bit about the parallels and also contrast that you have seen um, across, you know, the fintech ecosystem across different markets, especially I think previously you had, um, you started out your career and um, mm -hmm. at you know, McKinsey early on where you helped to launch new ventures and service lines and then have mm. been looking at this industry from both an operator angle as well as mm. from now an investment angle. Yeah. So so first of all, I think there's so much we can learn globally and across mm. borders. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, there's just so much arbitrage that you can do. And yeah. within financial services, I think what's particularly interesting is that uh, a lot of financial services and a lot of money is digitized already. Yeah. So it's very ripe for disruption versus mm -hmm. there are some industries, for example, like construction, there's only so much the technology can play a part in it, right? Like yep. it's still hard to get robots to, to build a building from scratch and all that. So financial services, I think it's very right for disruption. Mm -hmm. And sure, there might be some differences in local regulation, licensing mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. 
but there's a lot of lessons across borders. Uh, like for us, you know, part of the reason why we invested in it told me is that we saw how the buy now, pay later model worked, for example, in the US with a firm. Right. So we thought, you know, hey, this is uh this is uh something that could potentially work in the region. Obviously, you have to localize it, you know, you can't just copy and paste, mm -hmm. but you get inspired by models elsewhere. Yeah. Um, another example, uh, we also invest in a company in Africa, probably the largest fintech there called OPAY. Okay. And a big part of it was that we were inspired by what happened in China with Alipay mm. and WeChat Pay. And we saw that um, in emerging markets, you mm. have a lot of similar needs. And right. so uh, we invested in a team that we thought was best able to apply a lot of these learnings. Over. Very nice. Yeah. And, and, and do the kind of banking needs sort of differ between more mature markets like the US compared to, you know, Southeast Asia, which is a bit more emerging as a market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think um I think if we really have to draw a dichotomy, I mm -hmm. think the the developed markets definitely resemble each other a little more. There's some markets where the 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 traditional financial system, to be fair, it's not yeah. perfect, but it's relatively developed. Mm -hmm. right? A huge part of the population they already have access to uh bank bank accounts, for example. Yeah. And it's all about you know how do you add on new <laughs> banking or financial services features Correct. versus I think in developing countries. Uh, or emerging markets, there's a yeah. lot more, um, there's a lot less incumbents mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. like the existing infra isn't as developed, which means that a lot of times you might also have leapfrog opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. Like everyone knows that in China, but also in many parts of the world, yep. people went straight into uh, QR payments instead of credit cards. <laughs> um, okay. So so there's uh, there there is some differences there. Mm. And as you look at investments across different countries, are there different lens that you might apply um, as you consider investment opportunities? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think as an investor, we look at a couple of areas. One is we definitely look at the overall market, a lot of mm -hmm. the macro conditions. What's the size of the overall market? Yep. Uh, what's the GDP of the people? What's the underlying growth of the market? What's the mm -hmm. level of digitization? I yep. think those all affect uh, the opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, and specifically, for example, it affects the size of the opportunities. If yeah. you're looking at a huge market, um, you could just capture uh, even a niche area to begin with, for example, like the US or China, and yeah. you can still grow to become very big from there. But if you look at a pretty small market like Singapore, then it's very hard to, for example, build a niche player and grow that to become really big. Yep, 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 makes sense. Um, now I want to kind of turn back the time to uh, when you went to school. You're the first Singaporean to have graduated from Yale, Harvard, and Stanford. And at the same time, you left Singapore at a pretty young age. Um, have your career across, you know, many countries, at MIT, uh, being at um, as an MIT researcher in Cambridge, and then also uh, moving on to investment banking mm -hmm. in China, and then in the US, and then launching ventures with McKinsey, as we had spoken about a bit earlier. Um, and then also running on startups um, around the region. I think mm -hmm. my, my question my question was maybe could you maybe give us a walkthrough of um, mm -hmm. your journey across these different countries and how those experiences and perspectives have shaped the way that uh, maybe now you invest and also the way you look mm -hmm. at the world. Yeah, no, th <laughs> thanks for pointing those out. Uh, <laughs> definitely um, racked up my airline miles and student debt. <laughs> um, but but overall, I'm very grateful, right? In mm. some ways, sometimes I look at my peers or my friends, they seem to have taken a slightly more lenient path and done very mm -hmm. well for themselves. And yeah. I'm very happy for them. Uh, but for myself, I'm also very happy with the path I've taken. I think some of the underlying motivations was yeah. I was definitely very curious. Right? Right. Singapore is a great place to live and all that, but I've always been curious about the world outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have gone into, uh, actually, after JC, I applied to medical school at NUS, law school at SMU and all that. And I could have gone on a more professional path. Yeah. But I also really enjoyed uh, the path that I took where I pursued a liberal arts education. Mm -hmm. I got to learn areas that um, I never thought I would, you know, yeah. areas like psychology, areas like political science mm -hmm. that I would say maybe are not directly um, impactful to my career. But I, I do feel like if you connect the dots, yeah. uh, they're still very influential um and um an additive to the work that I do today. For mm. example, like political science. And I went to the government school as well. Yeah. Like today, like if you if you try to understand business, 
mm-hmm. you have to understand you know where the geopolitical tensions are going yep. you have to understand where national policies are going mm-hmm. right so having an understanding of some of the policies and political science frameworks i think can be very helpful yeah. and for psychology again it, it might not seem directly useful but mm-hmm. so much of what we do today is about at the end of the day we're we're working with humans we're dealing with humans yeah understanding how humans work Mm -hmm. and more specifically i think to to investments uh, a lot of it is understanding how the other party thinks Mm -hmm. right what are some psychological biases or tendencies that they might have so i think having that framework of psychology helps a lot as well so i think a lot of these learnings um you know looking looking uh, when i was making them I think a lot of what was driving me was just uh, around curiosity. Right. But I think looking back, I think a lot of these have come together to help me in my current career. Mm. And 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 maybe kind of um, would be helpful for you to also share with us, what was your mindset like as you decide to move from country to country, um, mm. region to region? How is that experience like, you know, building um, the network and your career from scratch in a new country, a new city? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, first of all, it was a lot of curiosity, right? Like, um, I, I was just doing it because I thought it was fun. You know, I right. love living in new places, experiencing mm-hmm. new cultures, yep. getting to know new people, um, mm-hmm. and, you know, sometimes picking up a new language. So I think it's just fun in itself. Right. Uh, but I think there's also an angle where um, I think pretty early on in my life, I saw mm-hmm. that, you know, we live in a very globalized world. Yep. Uh, as much as I love Singapore, I think Singapore... It's just, you know, one part of the world. Mm-hmm. And I think even to be a better Singaporean and to better contribute to Singapore, I think it's important to know, you know, who our neighbors are, mm-hmm. who our biggest trading partners are, yeah. and to be that bridge to help mm-hmm. to increase all that. I mean, there's a lot of stats around it, right? I think Singapore has more tourists uh, than its population, right? Mm-hmm. Tourist visits. I think our trade, our international trade is three times our GDP. So it's impossible for us to live within, just within our own corners, and yeah. you know ignore what's happening around the world so um and, and i think ultimately it's been very fulfilling as well mm-hmm. you know, being able to go abroad try out different things uh i think the good thing is that first of all coming from singapore mm-hmm. singapore comes with a very strong brand equity yeah i think people generally think that you know we are like you know rule abiding smart hardworking, uh, honest people mm-hmm. so it's also easy for us to go abroad i think obviously having a passport i think is it the most or second most powerful in the world allows us to travel as well yeah go to different right. places without the visa um and finally i think we're also blessed you know when i was growing up um learning a second language a third language i didn't and even growing up in a very multicultural uh society mm-hmm. i didn't realize that it's going to be so helpful but now as i go to foreign places and i have to pick mm-hmm. up new language and i have to work with people of different backgrounds and different yeah. religions and different cultures and different races. Uh, I think uh, coming from Singapore, we have a particular edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I think, you know, your curious, curiosity also extends to um, in, in school where you started China Hands, which was a leading kind of um, student-led platform, which offers a unique perspective on US-China relations. And then that kind of also transcended into how um, your career panned out ev- eventually. Um, how mm. what made you decide to start this platform? Uh, I I think part of um, I think part of it was when I was in school at Yale, mm. I, and I think this is uh very core to the U.S. culture as well. Yeah. A lot of times you just have to be a self starter, mm. and a lot of times if something does not exist, um, you don't always have to change it. Yeah, but you know, don't have fear, right? Just go create it. Um, I think a couple of things I felt. One was a lot of a lot of things in life, you know, whether it's taking an experiment, making a change, and mm-hmm. so on. I think um the risk isn't that high. Yeah. And for example, it it's it's the same for starting a magazine. Uh what I thought back then again was I was curious about this. I couldn't find any platform that fulfilled my interest. Mm-hmm. And I feel like everyone around me was interested in this space. For example, um uh, Chinese was the most popular foreign language at Yale at that time. Mm. Uh, and yet, you know, there was nothing that was talking about China and U.S.-China relations. Yeah. And obviously, as we know, this has developed into the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Um, so I just thought, you know, hey, I'm curious about it. I believe in the mission. Why not do something about it? And yeah. 
at the very at the very worst, you know, if everything fails, right? I still have I still gain some experience in terms of how to build something in terms mm -hmm. of the recruit a team, uh, yeah. and so on. So it was uh it was honestly not too much of a risk. It was just mm -hmm. uh why not kind of decision. <laughs> And, 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 you know, building on that right now, um, there has been a lot of talk around the U.S.-China relations. And um, I, I uh, my next question is around how do you see this evolving dynamics between these two superpowers? Um, what's mm -hmm. your first-hand view um, regarding this? And how, how do you think this has affected or impacted or will impact the global tech and startup scene going forward? Yeah, I, I, I think the... The geopolitical tensions are here to stay. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to disappear anytime. At the same time, I'm hopeful, and I think a lot of the leadership, um, you know, of these major countries, uh, including you know Singapore's own leaders, yeah. Um, I think no one wants you know a hot war, a major conflict. Um, but there is going to be a lot of tension. There's going to be a lot of competition, and I think how it spills over into, um, into. Uh, the world. I think first of all, we're gonna have um a lot of competition over tech itself, mm. as we saw. I think there's been a lot of restrictions placed on both sides yeah. regarding you know the investments in tech companies mm. and so on. Uh, I think some of these are here to stay. I think mm. and some of them will accelerate. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, I think creates opportunities as well. Yeah, uh, like look at Singapore. Uh, so many. Uh, companies are based out of Singapore today, both mm -hmm. American and Chinese companies, yeah, uh, because right. Singapore is seen as a neutral place. Um, so I think there are opportunities that come with that as well. I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there's still so much, um, you know, synergies between the U.S. and China, mm -hmm. uh, and both their economies. This is not like the Cold War, where yeah. the two economies of the U.S. and USSR were pretty much, yeah. um, out of whack from each other, out of sync. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the Chinese and the U.S. economy, I think they're very interlinked. And I think there's still going to be a lot of trade and all that that's going on. Um, sometimes, you know, it goes through a middle country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we just have to adjust to the to the changing paradigms and find new opportunities. Yeah, 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 yeah. Makes sense. And, and also, you know, you have been um since you have started writing for um china hands and then um now you're also you have also been contributing articles to um in the forbes and then writing on a various um different topics and uh, you know from like talking about the israeli startup ecosystem and then also covering things like crazy rich asians brand strategy um how does this media experience uh, or writing experience mm. continue to complement what you're doing right now uh, was it mm. also piqued by curiosity that you you got into this and uh, mm. what 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 does it look like next for you yeah no i i think going back to the uh, it doesn't seem that related when mm. I was doing it, but looking back, I think the dots really connect. Right. Uh, and overall, I'm uh and and even like we're doing a podcast today, I guess this is a form of media and journalism as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I found a lot of journalists have applied their their skill sets to other areas. Yeah. Um, like one of the most famous venture capitalists of all time, Mike Moritz, mm. he who who led Sequoia for many decades. Uh, he actually started his career as a reporter at Time Magazine. And he was noticed because he was writing really interesting and insightful articles about tech companies such as Apple. Mm -hmm. So that's how he ended up at Sequoia. Um, I think in terms of very tangible ways in which it affects my life today, I think, first of all, um, looking for a good investment mm -hmm. and putting together investment memo, I think it is very similar to looking for a good story and putting right. together an article. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, uh, when I was writing articles, um, I was able to put myself in the shoes of my readers and I always think about, you know, am I adding something new? Mm. Uh, is this, does this story make sense? Mm. Is this the right way to frame it? Mm. And I think now when I'm writing an investment memo, it's very similar as well. How you communicate, how you put things together, how you connect the dots, I think it's hugely important. Yeah. I think number two, uh, I think journalism and working on media has also mm -hmm. helped me uh, learn to gather a lot of data mm. um, and and be very creative and resourceful about it and ultimately connect the dots between the data. Yeah. And it's similarly true for investment as well. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately for investment, obviously there's the judgment part of it, but the other part of it is even getting uh, information and hopefully right. getting some asymm asymmetric 
uh, informational in, information ha- uh, edge. And I think what I learned as a journalist, which is just being very resourceful about finding new data points, mm-hmm. uh, finding proxy of data points, trying to uh, be creative about uh, about that, I think has helped a lot. And I think finally, a lot of media and mm. for investing is also around uh, working with people. Yeah. Like when I was a journalist, I remember like I was, you know, in my early 20s and, um, you know, whether it's in interviewing people mm-hmm. or finding people to talk to, uh, very much putting myself out there to, to leverage other people and to work with them and to talk mm-hmm. to them. And I think it's very similar in investments as well whether it's talking to other investors, talking Mm -hmm. to founders, talking to people in the ecosystem. It's very much about working with people and talking to people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and, and that's very interesting because you... um... I, I start to see a lot of parallels in both the roles that you have mentioned. And um, what I'm curious about is how do you kind of keep abreast of different um, news around different regions and countries and how do you decide what inspire you to write or pick the next story? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think in terms of what I read, mm-hmm. um, I, I think it is about finding sources that um, I think interest you, okay. that I think gives you the right amount of information and so on. So I do subscribe to quite a few uh, newsletters okay. um, that I, I read a lot. Um, I think for example, over other platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter, mm-hmm. I think they've started to learn about the people that I like to read, uh, the kind of articles I like to engage with. So I think they tend to push me relatively mm-hmm. good articles. And same for my phone. Like yeah. I use a Chrome browser and they recommend some articles, right? I think they do a pretty good job. Maybe like one out of five articles that they recommend, I'll read it. So I think that's part of it. Okay. Um, and, and also I think, at the end of the day, we're all very busy people, right? I think yeah. it's also finding ways to maybe multitask whenever possible mm. and also finding a portfolio of things to get more information from. Uh, so on the multitasking point, what I do is that I really like podcasts. Mm. I think especially for longer form stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I I just listened to a three-hour podcast on Visa yesterday oh. on this acquired podcast. Yeah. So what I was doing was that I think I was traveling somewhere so I just listened to it on the way there. And I think I listened to it when I was like cleaning up the house. Mm. Uh, and sometimes when I go to the gym and I'm on the, on the bike in the gym, you know, I can also like uh, read some articles as well. So yeah. that's kind of on the, um, on the multitasking point. Mm-hmm. I think on the other point of um, also having a portfolio, uh, what I sometimes do is, uh, is also like, I, I think it's easy for us, you know, if you like a, a topic, you know, you just keep reading stuff. Mm-hmm. that you know it seems like you're being very productive but ultimately you know you're just reading the same thing from a different angle so i try to make sure that i i'm also like getting information and reading articles and podcasts from more diverse voices mm. to to actively force myself to be exposed to new viewpoints to learn something new versus yeah. just you know understanding one space really well uh, and as mentioned like so many things are interconnected Mm-hmm. Like even if I'm looking at fintech stuff, maybe you're looking at a different sector, uh, it helps me understand the trends in that industry that right. might, might potentially be related to or at least relevant to uh, what's happening in the fintech yeah. space. Yeah, 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 yeah. And which topics would be of current interest to you right now? <laughs> right now, uh, there's quite a few. Like one, mm. obviously people are talking about Charlie Munger. Mm. Uh, he's always seen someone I respected. So just reading some of the rereading some of his best works and right. most interesting quotes has been interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also following a lot of things in AI. Okay. Like there's just so much that's happening in AI. <laughs> um, like for example, yesterday there's a company that that has been around for a while, but yesterday they came up with a big PR push called Pika Lab. Mm. And uh, you know, they're just able to generate incredible uh, AI videos. Oh, so yes, yes, <laughs> Yeah, right. It's, it's yeah. pretty amazing what it can do. Right. Um, so I think, yeah, just, just reading about, you know, many different things, right? I was reading a lot about the macro economy mm. and geopolitics. I think those are actually quite relevant to where the world is moving and yeah. to a lot of our work, even if it doesn't seem so direct. <laughs> yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. And also because, like, uh, it's, it's important to keep 
in touch with things that are at a macro level and then you can see how that trickles down into the day-to-day -day things mm -hmm. that you do um, not just from a portfolio management perspective but also in terms of um, investment choices and 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 where you where we put our money in um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah, 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 and totally. and and kind of diving a bit more into the startup space, which you have spent quite a bit of time in. What are some of the key takeaways you have for founders who are looking to expand um, to mm. different countries and regions, especially since you have been looking at pretty global mm. startups so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think uh, international expansion is not easy, mm -hmm. but I I do think it pays a lot of dividends, especially if you're also from a smaller market like Singapore. Yeah. I think you have to, if you want to build something big, you have to go to different markets. Yeah. If you're in a market like the US where it's huge, you can, you know, you can spend a lot of time in the US. But, mm. you know, at some point, if you become super big, you have to go abroad as well. Yeah. I think some some learnings or observations I've made, uh, I think, first of all, a lot of times as the, let's say if you're a founder, mm. the culture and, and all that starts from you. Right. And I think if you want to be global, you want to mm -hmm. build a global team, you want to build a global organization, uh, that's competitive globally, I yep. think you have to start from yourself. Mm. Uh, I think very often uh, firms that uh, talk about being global, but you know, starting from the top, uh, they're not very global. I think it's very hard to make it happen because it's, now, it's always going to be an afterthought. It's always right. going to be uh, a lower priority. But I think for yourself, you need to be able to be global to attract mm -hmm. global talent and so on. Uh, I think number two, it's also about I think both leveraging some of these global learnings and cross-border learnings, but also learning how to localize effectively. Yeah. I think most business models that try to just copy and paste haven't worked out very well. Uh, but I think you have to spend some time, um, you know, feeling the ground, smelling the air, living like a local. Mm. Um, so I to give an example, I'm, uh, I was talking to uh, the founder of C Group a couple of years ago before they really expanded in, in Latin. And, and what he said was, you know, he literally brought the whole management team over to Latam for two weeks before right. they decided to invest big time there. And for two weeks, they just lived like locals. Right. They just right. try to understand really how everything works. Because at a high level, maybe emerging markets are similar, but still people are very different. And even within Latam, when I was there, like Mexico is very different from Brazil, which is very right. different from Argentina or Peru. And yeah. just like, you know, people come to Southeast Asia, think it's a whole monolithic region mm -hmm. you know we all know that indonesia is very different from singapore and very different from philippines or, or vietnam mm -hmm. so i think really knowing how to localize um i think it's important as well yeah and and, and what i really like was that he didn't just bring as in live there himself but he also brought the entire management team so that everyone can collectively agree and share their perspectives on the market and really truly understand what it's like to expand into let them for uh at least two weeks and then of course longer beyond that um and i you know one of the interesting things that you have mentioned is how founders um can need to start thinking global um, and mm. that needs to start from the top what 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 in your view makes a global founder or how can they uh, do more of that? How to be more of a global founder? Um, I would say that, I would say that frankly, now the world has made it much easier mm -hmm. to be a global founder as well compared to even, I think, five years ago. Yeah. Um, I think there's so many translation software. I think for better or for worse, COVID has made remote work a lot more commonplace. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cross-border hiring platforms such as mm -hmm. Deal and mm -hmm. Multiplier have come up. So it's a lot easier and to take care of like payments, compliance, uh, and even talent talent aggregation. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot easier compared to before, to be to be frank. Uh, but what does it take to be global? I think um, I think it's still back to mindset because yeah. there's a lot of maybe harder skill sets that you can pick up. Mm -hmm. right? Like, sure, you know, it's impossible to be to be uh, to know every language well uh, yeah. but what you realize is that a lot of leaders um, it's not really about how fluent you are per se in a foreign mm -hmm. language I think it's due back to uh, things like charisma conviction and so on mm -hmm. look at someone like Jack Ma right? he doesn't speak perfect English mm -hmm. but people uh, around the world I remember uh, I knew founders from Southeast Asia from Latin from Africa a few years ago were saying that, you know, hey, I want to be the Jack Ma of my country. Right? <laughs> yeah. he, he, he was 
he was um inspiring speaking you know when he was spoken in a different language yeah so i think a lot of these harder skills mm-hmm. uh, i think uh, not harder skills i would say like maybe more technical or linguistic skills i think having some baseline like english is definitely the most common global language i think it's yeah. useful but i think it really still comes down to a global mindset mm-hmm. knowing that you want to be global knowing that you want to have a global team mm-hmm. knowing that you want to operate globally yeah i think some of that some of those are more important than um than other stuff that's a bit more superficial yeah 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 makes sense Okay, and um, just to wrap up the English segment uh, for today's podcast, um, based on, you know, all the experiences that you've shared and um, all the experiences that you've personally experienced, um, what does the next five years look like for you? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, the question I do think about at, at mm-hmm. the end of the day, um, I think it was Eisenhower who had a quote, which says that uh, plans are useless, but planning is everything. <laughs> so I'm I'm very aware that in the next five years, whatever I'm planning today is probably not going to happen mm. the way um it, 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 I'd expect uh, I plan for it to be. Uh, but I think at a high level, what I'm looking for, uh, I think I'm going to continue what I'm doing in investment. Mm-hmm. I think especially for early stage investment, it's also a very long term career. Yeah. Like I might invest in a company today, and five years later, maybe it's just starting to blossom and grow. So it does take time for companies to mature and grow into truly big companies, mm-hmm. uh, if not unicorn companies as well. So I think five years from now, I'll still be doing the same job, um, helping some of my co- current companies grow into hopefully large generational companies, uh, but also applying some of the new learnings I have uh, to, to then invest in new companies. And I think on the personal front, I think it's still keeping myself active outside of work. Mm. Uh, trying to spend time with family, uh, trying to be continue to be curious about the world, just like I think Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. Even I think in their very old days, they're like still reading as much as they can, mm. right? Because it's good to stay curious, to keep your mind active, uh, and to just learn. I think learning is a privilege. Uh, and then as part of that, I think another part of it is just keeping um our body and our mind healthy. Yeah, because I feel like now there's more awareness about um keeping fit and mental yeah. health. Yes. Uh, but still, I think I, I, unless we actively set aside time, uh, it's easy to forget about those and deprioritize them. Yeah, 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 and really commit yourself to that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Build build them into habits. Yes, yes. Okay, with that, we wrap up the English segment of um, today's episode. And now we move on to the Chinese rapid fire questions. Um, now, we are going to do the quick and quick change. David, are you ready? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. 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 呃、uh, ，在中国、在美国和东南亚各地工作，然后我现在是一个呃投资人，在金沙江创投，然后主要投特别早期的呃科技公司，然后也很幸运能够跟一些很棒的创业家一起合作，帮他们建立他们的公司。对，就是呃，之前在英文的播客当中你说了，就是呃 ，curiosity 是一个，就是一一个呃。一直激发你的一个呃啊、呃，怎么讲 ？One area， 然后就是你希望，就是现在你希望学习学习或提高的一个领域会是哪一方面呢？嗯，我觉得工作方面肯定想提高的就是啊、呃，对于 AI 的理解，就是所谓的人工智能。啊、嗯呃，我觉得现在呃，这个领域我觉得就是每天发展的特别多。然后我觉得它真的会颠覆每一个每一个行业，嗯，啊、呃，我觉得在各国各地都会看得到，所以我觉得真的就是想想去多了解 AI 到底是啊、呃、是怎么样的一种科技，然后未来给我们带来的一些影响会是怎么样的，啊、呃，然后我觉得除此以外就是也是有一些业余的一些啊、呃、学习方面啊、呃、学习想学习的东西，比如说我现在也在啊、呃、我特别喜欢吃东西。<笑>所以我也有时候喜欢去烧烧饭，所以我经常去啊、oh. 呃、超市上啊、呃、烧一些不同的一些饭菜，所以那个可以算是生活上的一些学习。<笑>
是啊，挺有趣的。那你在 AI 就是学习方面，你是呃怎么样去就是更加提高自己的知识呢？就是呃是读书吗？还是刚才你所说的，就是你也挺喜欢看播客、听播客？嗯、对，嗯。对，我觉得，呃，我觉得学习肯定是要通过各种方式，一个是各种渠道，和个人也要不同的，通过不同的方式嘛。因为比如说古希腊人他们有句话说，你要学的话，你第一你要去，你要去读，第二你要去说，然后第三你要去教。所以我觉得，呃，我觉得对我来说学习也一样，比如说读的方面，不管是比如说听一些博，呃，听一些 podcast 啊，或者是。在 Twitter 上面啊，我自己去尝试，比如说我自己会去 Discord 里面看大家是怎么生成一些新的图像啊，或者是自己去尝试一些新的 AI 工具。然后我觉得另外一部分就是书，找一些志同道合，然后我觉得比较比较有想法的一些同学，而且大家不一定需要想法一致，但反正大家可以比较呃开放性的去讨论。然后第三，我觉得某程度上也是去教吧。当然，教的话也我我也不算高人，但很多时候就是至少能做一个分享。啊，像我们之前提到，为什么去写作，或者为什么会去呃做一些博客啊等等的。我觉得很多时候，呃，不能说教，但很多时候，就像巴菲特自己说，他每次写他的。啊、呃，每年的年呃年年报的时候，他说不是为了他的投资，是为了他自己，因为你能够<笑>能够把把你呃很多思思路和很多想法写下来，然后从中你其实也学到一些新的东西。嗯，那在你就是呃你的职业生涯当中，你有没有曾经遇到过一个非常重要，或者是一个对你啊、呃、本本身就是觉得很？很有影响力的一个导师呢，我觉得导师肯定有很多，而且现在现在每天也是，都会有很多导师，包括啊、呃，我我在我的公司也是，我觉得我的老板算我的导师，我才去那里工作。呃，但可能讲一个也让我特别有启发的一个人，我觉得还是呃，新加坡第一个总第一位总理李光耀先生。嗯，啊，我觉得就第一，每天我。体会的，比如说新加坡的很多福利、新加坡的设施、新加坡的呃特点特征，我觉得也都是因为啊、呃、先人啊、呃、当时做出的一些，不光是牺牲和当时比较鲜明的一些、嗯、一些见解吧。对啊、呃，然后我虽然现在是做科技投资啊、呃，但我最喜欢的就是啊、呃、跟创业家合作。嗯、然后我觉得某程度上，我觉得李光耀也是一个特别有创业精神的一个人。是啊、然后新加坡就像他当时做的一个创业项目，嗯，所以我也是特别敬佩啊，他当时能有这种创业精神啊，把把一个国家建立起来。对对对对对对对，就是很敬佩，也是今年是呃李光耀他的呃一百年的一个生生计，所以就呃、嗯、也很 timely <笑>、嗯。对。对那嗯， um, 之前刚才你所说的，就是你现在也是专注于在 Web 三，还有那个金融科技这这领域，这两道领域就去、嗯、呃更呃详细的投资，也是因为就是之前的工作经验也是专注于这些领域嘛。嗯、那嗯、呃，就是向向前看的话，你认为在这两、嗯、两道板块的当中，最大的机遇会是在啊、呃、哪一方面呢？嗯对，我觉得真的机遇很多很多啊、呃！但我真的要去想的话，可能我觉得，呃，可能最颠覆性的还是可能 AI 会带来的一些一些机会，而且我觉得可能 AI 会带来一些机会，可能我们今天可能都想象不出来。嗯，其实往往最大的机会，呃，他们都是比较颠覆性的，就是很多时候都是当时不存在的，就像很多人，呃，比如说。啊、呃，我们我们有第一个汽车的时候，啊、呃，我们如果有之前问大家说，你们觉得未来的交通怎么样？大家可能说，哦，我可能有一匹马，我的马可能现在更壮一点，或者我可能有两匹马去帮我拉一个车，对,对不对？是，就是你很难很难去想象，比如说有些新的科技会怎么颠覆一个行业。嗯，所以我觉得我们现在想的可能是觉得像 AI 会帮忙，像银行的客服。啊，会提高他们的客服能力啊，等等
但我我觉得 AI 今后可能对于这个行业还是会有一些特别颠覆、特别特别啊、呃、颠覆性的一些改变，而且会带来很多颠覆性的机会。嗯。好，那呃，就今天的问题就到到此为止。那非常感谢 David 百忙之中抽空和我们分享你的经验，也是就分享你一些对于不同的领域或者不同前景的一些看法。呃，非常感谢。嗯、对，我特别高兴有机会我们可以一起啊、呃、聊一下，然后也、嗯、也多谢你啊、呃、给我这机会。Yeah, thank you so much, David, for taking the time to share with us your experiences. Um, personally, I'm very inspired by you know the how your curiosity has taken you to so many different places and how these experiences added up. And also, as a founder myself, I'm very inspired by how you just you know um be willing to try and 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 take new things so long as you see that there's an opportunity to do so. Um, so thank you so much for joining us on today's episode, David. Of course, thanks so much for inviting me. Also, very inspired by your own journey and uh. <laughs> Hope to hope to keep in touch. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Business Beyond Borders. If you have any feedback or thoughts, do write into us at support at blueend dot com. Click to follow to tune into the next episode. See you again soon.